Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. We will take up the articles from the Hindu and discuss them as per the demands of civil services examination. The topics of the discussion are listed on your screen. As today is Thursday, this is the question of the day which is on your screen. The topic has appeared on the DNS dated 31st Jan 2023. Attempt this question and answer the same and submit it on the e-learn platform to get it evaluated from the expert evaluators at Rouse IIS. Moving on to the first article of the day that has featured on page 7 of the Hindu, basically talks about the heightened border challenge in the state of Tamil Nadu. Now Tamil Nadu as a state share approximately 1076 km of long porous coastline and faces a heightened border challenge after many years. The article highlights that intelligence have been won in the state government against the entry of drug lords and the infiltrators through the sea routes, as earlier a speedboat was abandoned on the shore of Dhanushkondi. Further, the article also mentions about the arrival of Sri Lankan Tamil refugees and smugglers that includes drugs, arms and human trafficking. It also highlights a growing nexus between Sri Lanka and that of China, wherein the central and the state intelligence agencies have issued advisories about people's liberation army and their personnel who have landed in Sri Lanka with satellite drones and other high-tech communication gadgets and are exploring the option of sea cucumber farming. And this Chinese investment in the sea cucumber farming in the northern Sri Lanka has sparked a security concern as these projects are very close to the southern coast of India. Now UPSC under the GS3 syllabus has provided for the security challenges and the management of the border areas, their linkages with organized crime and terrorism. Apart from that, it also mentions various security forces, agencies and their mandate. Now maritime security also forms an important part of this subject. As in 2014, UPSC has already asked questions related to the India's maritime security concern and thus we can very well expect a question on similar lines in the mains examination. During our discussion on this article, we will try to understand India's coastal security architecture we will also try to understand what is the need to ensure maritime security, what are the issues that India is currently facing in the coastal or the maritime security and at the last we will also see the steps that have been already taken by the government of India and the steps that are need to be taken. Now we will first try to understand the structure of coastal security in India. Coastal security in India is governed by three tiered structure that consists of Indian Navy, Indian Coast Guard and the State Coastal or Marine Police. Now the Indian Navy safeguards or patrols the International Maritime Boundary Line, while the Indian Coast Guard on the other hand is mandated to provide patrolling facilities as well as the surveillance facilities up to 200 nautical miles or the exclusive economic zone of India. Simultaneously, the State Coastal or the Marine Police performs patrolling in the shallow coastal areas and have a jurisdiction which is restricted to 12 nautical miles from the coast. Further, the Indian Navy and the Indian Coast Guard have the jurisdiction over the entire maritime zone that is up to the 200 nautical mile area including the territorial waters also. Apart from this, BSF that is the Border Security Force is deployed in the creek areas of Gujarat and that of Sundarbans in West Bengal. Now this brings us to the question that what is the need for ensuring maritime or coastal security. Now we all know that India has a large coastline of 7516 kilometers and the seaborne trade accounts for 95 percent of the country's total trade. However, the Indian coast have been vulnerable to various criminal and anti-national activities as numerous cases of smuggling, trafficking and infiltration have been reported as similarly we have discussed for the case of Tamil Nadu. So this brings us to the question of the need. The first need is to ensure protection against the maritime terrorism. Maritime terrorism can be in the form of attack on the ports or attacks on Indian ships as well as attacks on important tourist and commercial destinations like that of hotels as it was seen during the 26-11 attack at Taj 
and other hotels. The second need of protecting or ensuring coastal security is against piracy. Now the piracy has increased in the recent time along the both western and the eastern sector. Further, as majority of the Indian trade happens through the sea route, smuggling is also prevalent in this area. Apart from smuggling, human trafficking is also an area which needs protection. Apart from that, the sea route have become a new area of infiltration and refugee inflicts. Infiltration in the form of terrorism for which we can quote the example of 2611 where the terrorists entered through the sea route in India and the refugee influx due to crisis situation in the neighboring countries for example in that of Sri Lanka or that of Myanmar. Another need to ensure coastal security or strong coastal security architecture is the drug trafficking. Now drug trafficking in the recent years have been on the rise and particularly in the western sector where huge quantities of contraband drugs were seized last year. And India also has a curious location of located between the Golden Crescent and the Golden Triangle which further complicates the issue. At last, the safety of fishermen is also important and thus there is a need to ensure strong coastal security for India. Now that we have discussed coastal security architecture in India, as well as the need to ensure coastal security or enhance it, we'll try to understand what are the current issues that the maritime border security or the coastal security in India today face. Now the first issue that is faced is related to the fragmented approach. Now Indian maritime border security faces overlapping jurisdiction and also there is issue of lack of unity in command. Now before discussing our point, we have to understand two terms. One is territorial sea that is an area up to the 12 nautical mile and another is the contiguous zone that is an area which is up to 24 nautical mile. Now under the fragmented approach, the first issue is related to land and maritime border guarding. Now management of international land as well as coastal borders falls under the purview of Ministry of Home Affairs. India shares maritime boundaries with seven countries. But unlike the land boundaries which can be fenced, maritime boundaries on the other hand cannot be fenced. And India is also a party to UNCLOS that is United Nations Convention on the Laws of Sea and entitles the countries to maritime zones. Thus, this complicates the process of maritime security or maritime border management as India has to balance its own sovereign rights while giving due respect to the rights of other states, their vessels, that is the freedom to use seas. The second issue here is related to mixture of policing and maritime border guarding. Now we have seen the India's coastal security architecture under which an area up to the 12 nautical mile is guarded by the state maritime police. While on the other hand, border security is under the purview of Ministry of Home Affairs. That is, there is a conflation of state list versus the union list as it conflates the responsibility of law and order with that of maritime border security. Apart from this, there is also another problem. Though the border security is the responsibility of Ministry of Home Affairs, but Indian Navy and Indian Coast Guard who are primarily responsible for providing maritime security falls under the jurisdiction of Ministry of, Ministry of Defense and not under the MHA which is primarily responsible for the border security. The third issue under the fragmented approach is the look over by the task force which was established for the similar purpose. Now the task force did not mention the shift of Indian Coast Guard from the purview of Ministry of Defense to that of Ministry of Home Affairs as well as neither did it recommended creation of a separate force exclusively for maritime border security. The second major issue that is plaguing the maritime security in India is that role to be played by Indian Coast Guard. Now Indian Coast Guard under the Indian Coast Guard Act of 1978 was primarily established for policing and providing 
जनरल सुप्रिंटेंडेंट इन द एरियाज ऑफ मेरीटाइम सिक्योरिटी विच वर रिलेटेड टू कॉम्बैट स्मगलिंग एंड अदर इलीगल मेरीटाइम एक्टिविटीज हाउ एवर नाउ द रोल ऑफ इंडियन कोस्ट गार्ड हैव डाइवर्सिफाइड एंड डज नॉट अलाइन विद द प्राइमरी रोल दैट इट वॉज गिवन ड्यूरिंग द इंडियन कोस्ट गार्ड एक्ट ऑफ नाइनटीन सेवेंटी एट एंड कोस्टल सिक्योरिटी डज नॉट फॉल्स अंडर द प्राइमरी टास्क ऑफ द इंडियन कोस्ट गार्ड विच इज ऑलरेडी ओवर स्ट्रे द थर्ड इशू दैट इज फेस अंडर द मेरीटाइम सिक्योरिटी इज द अनकलियर डेफिनेशन एंड द डिफ्यूज रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी फर्स्टली द टर्मिनलॉजीज लाइक मेरीटाइम सिक्योरिटी कोस्टल सिक्योरिटी कोस्ट लाइन ऑफ शोर सिक्योरिटी हैज नॉट बीन डिफाइंड अंडर एनी स्टैचुटरी डॉक्यूमेंट दैट इज इट इज नॉट डिफाइंड अंडर द नेवी एक्ट or the indian coast guard act neither they were defined under the ccs directive of 2009 and this creates lack of clarity in jurisdiction between the indian navy indian coast guard and that of state maritime police the term maritime security has been defined under the indian maritime act now as per the ccs directive of 2009 indian coast guard is responsible of providing coastal security in the areas of territorial sea and we have already discussed that territorial sea is an area up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline however the coastal waters have been defined to stretch to 24 nautical mile which is defined as the contiguous zone which we have already discussed in the very beginning therefore this leaves a gap of 12 nautical mile between the territorial sea and the contiguous zone which now comes under the purview of indian navy though under the security doctrine indian coast guard is to provide coastal security further there is also disparities in responsibility now indian coast guard is provided with the responsibility of providing security in areas of territorial sea that is the 12 nautical miles while on the other hand indian navy has been provided responsibility of providing security up to the 200 nautical mile area this creates a problem as the indian navy is now overstretched as the patrolling vessel strength of the two that is indian coast guard and that of indian navy is comparable offshore security is another area where there is unclear definitions now as far as the offshore security is concerned there is a flag officer defense advisory group which is tasked with the primary responsibility of providing advice to government of india and different ministries however the indian coast guard act of 1978 gives this responsibility of providing offshore security to offshore terminals islands and other installation to the indian coast guard and the flag officer of the defense advisory group provides offshore security responsibility to indian navy thus basically again it is a conflict of interest between the indian navy and indian coast guard over their jurisdiction the next issue that the indian coastal security architecture today faces is the identification and trafficking of sub 20 meter vessel now after the attacks of 2611 it was mandated to put a ais system that is automatic identification system on ships that were greater than 20 meter in length however there is a challenge in equipping the vessels that are less than 20 meter and which are approximately 1.6 lakhs in number and forms the bulk of the shipping fleet therefore their tracking as well as their identification becomes very difficult the last issue is related to lack of parameters which help us to determine the actual efficacy of any coastal security measure that has been taken now any of the policing activity that has been undertaken by the indian coast guard or even state maritime police the arrest and the seizures that are made by the indian coast guard or the state maritime police are not reflected under the annual records of the national crime records bureau thus there is no way to determine the success of implementation of the coastal security scheme and how well they are performing 
as we have now discussed the issue we'll try to understand what are the steps that have been taken for maritime security now government of india has taken various steps national maritime security coordinator has been established now national maritime security coordinator under the national security advisor or the nsa will provide a long way in streamlining the maritime governance and development of the maritime sector as a whole a five point framework for maritime security has also been adopted which includes removal of barriers resolution of disputes joint tracking of maritime threats from non state actors and natural disasters conservation of maritime environment and resources and responsible connectivity among different maritime players as their key points apart from this there has been creation of unified maritime command which is headed by the indian navy ensuring integrated maritime security enhanced coastal surveillance network has also been established which includes 46 radars to provide real time coastal monitoring and surveillance by the indian coast guard and also includes deployment of ships and aircraft for surveillance on the daily basis now the next measure that has been adopted is related to capacity building of indian navy and establishment of naval bases as a part of capacity building india has achieved the nuclear triad inducted aircraft carrier that is ins vikrant launched missions like that of mission sagar and have been establishing itself as a key responder in providing humanitarian and disaster relief operations apart from it naval bases have also been established by indian navy wherein with singapore it has struck a deal for changi naval base access to the port of dukm in oman and development of agalega port in mauritius can be seen as initiatives which have been taken to expand the security architecture of india the last measure that can be counted as expanding the indian coastal security architecture is participation in the regional groupings like that of indian ocean rim association indian ocean naval symposium indian ocean commission that of bimstec and culminated colombo security dialogue so this brings us to the question what extra can be done to improve the coastal security architecture or the maritime security aspect of india and the first in this regard is creating a separate force that is splitting the maritime border guarding function and associated infrastructure from the indian coast guard and placing it directly under the ministry of home affairs the group of ministers have also recommended a comprehensive strategy for the improvement of border management and at the last as we have discussed that indian coast guard neither has the mandate and has been overstretched there is a need to strengthen the indian coast guard to play a leadership role in the coastal security and for this the ambiguities and the lacunes in the indian coast guard act of 1978 has to be corrected and the anachronic provisions needs to be removed with this we have discussed all the aspects of indian coastal security architecture wherein we have discussed the coastal security architecture that is the three tier setup in india we have also discussed the need the issues that the indian coastal security today faces the initiatives that have been taken by the government and the way forward to realize the full potential of coastal security or maritime security in india moving on to the next article of the day that has featured on page 8 of the hindu under the text and context section basically talks about the disinvestment and the status and the proceeds currently it has in the current budget year now upsc under the gs3 syllabus mentions about mobilization of resources under the indian economic section and in the previous year has asked questions related to mobilization of resources directly and indirectly in mains as well as also in the prelims examination so this area becomes important for us during our discussion on this topic we'll try to understand basically what disinvestment is why does government go for disinvestment how disinvestment is different from that of privatization 
methods of disinvestment, advantages and disadvantages and at the last we will also analyze the current trend. So beginning our discussion we will first understand what basically disinvestment is. Disinvestment is nothing but withdrawal of capital that is invested through sell out. It involves conversion of money claims or securities either into money or cash. Now basically disinvestment can be done by any organization or the government by selling or liquidating an asset or the subsidiary. It is also referred as capital expenditure reduction sometimes as this can facilitate reallocation of resources to more productive areas within an organization or government funded product. The next thing to understand about disinvestment is that there is no change in the management of the PSUs from the public to the private hands as the government still holds a majority equity of 51%. Even if the shares or the government equity falls below 51%, the rest of the equity is sold in such a way that no one institution or individual holds enough stake to control the management meaning thereby the decision will then come through consensus. And disinvestment primarily is a money raising exercise and the proceeds of disinvestment are treated as non-debt creating capital risk. Now this brings us to the question that who looks after the disinvestment process in India. The Department of Investment and Public Asset Management under Ministry of Finance looks after the affairs of disinvestment in the public sector enterprise and disinvestment is a part of non-debt capital received that we have already discussed apart from recovery of loans and advances. This brings us to the next logical question that why will any government go for disinvestment or why will any government disinvest its asset. For this government of India has announced the disinvestment policy. And as per the disinvestment policy of government of India, the main objectives of disinvestment in India are the first is to reduce the fiscal burden on the government of the day. The second is to improve the public finances and its status. The third objective is to increase the ownership that is to widen the ownership share. The fourth objective is to introduce competition that is to reduce monopoly and to instill a sense of market discipline. Disinvestment is also seen as a step to depoliticize essential services which can be politicized due to the popular measures that any government of the day can adopt and to overcome this problem disinvestment is done. It is also done to fund growth and direct resources toward more productive areas of the economy. And it is also done to initiate diversification and expansion. So now that we have seen that why does government go for disinvestment in the first day, we will also understand the difference between disinvestment and privatization. Now basically before discussing it, we have to understand two terminologies. The first terminology here is that of strategic sale. Now it occurs when there is a sale of substantial portion of government holding which can be 50% or higher in a PSU along with the transfer of management control. And another issue after strategic sale is the privatization wherein this is also a type of strategic sale wherein government dilutes its entire shareholding along with transfer of management. In strategic sale there may be some amount of equity that is left with the government but in the case of privatization government dilutes its entire shareholding and there is also transfer of management control for example in the recent case of Air India. Now let us understand the difference between disinvestment and privatization in more detail. In disinvestment government only sells a minor stake to the private entity and holds the majority stake for itself. While in the case of privatization, government may sell a majority stake or the entire subsidiary which results in government losing the control as well as the ownership. As in the case of disinvestment, government retains the control while in the case of privatization, there is a change of management and government thus loses the control. 
The share holding pattern in case of disinvestment is such that government still retains more than 50% and in case of privatization government retains less than 50% or sometimes the ownership may be entirely transferred and government equity ownership can be 0%. The examples of disinvestment in India is that of Indian Oil Corporation, LIC, Rail Vikas Nigam, IRCTC, etc. While that of privatization in India is entire disinvestment in cases of Videsh Sanchar Nigam Limited or the VSNL, recently Air India, Balco, Maruti Udyog, etc. Another thing to understand here. If an action is taken opposite to that of privatization, meaning thereby government acquire the assets or equity of any private firm, it is known as nationalization. So this brings us to the next part of our discussion that what are the advantages of undertaking disinvestment. The first advantage for the now disinvestment has varied advantages on different stakeholders. For example, on government, market and the economy, on employees, PSUs and also on the retail investment. For government, through disinvestment, it can reduce the burden by raising valuable resources that can be used to bridge fiscal deficit and it can also be used, it can be also used to redirect government spending on other social infrastructure project or to other profit making PSUs. It will also lead to a leaner government in business and government can also focus on core activities like that of infrastructure, defense, education and healthcare, thus thereby fulfilling its social obligations towards the people. The advantage for market and the economy is that it brings about greater efficiencies for the economy and the market as a whole and thus increases the competitiveness in market. For the employees, it brings monetary gains through ESOPs and preferential issue of share. For PSUs, it provides for greater autonomy and the introduction of corporate governance as seen by the examples where disinvestment have been taken leads to higher efficiency. And for the retail investment, it unlocks the share through disinvestment and allow the retail investors to invest in the companies, for example, in the case of LIC. So that we have now discussed the advantages of disinvestment, we will also discuss some of the drawbacks of the disinvestment. The first drawback of the disinvestment is that the government shareholding in the public sector units as a public asset should not be liquidated to meet the immediate needs as PSUs contribute to public finances through dividends and disinvestment can reduce this important source of finance for the government. Further, the public sector undertaking also acts as a check on the private enterprises and safeguards the wider public interest in the market. For example, in the absence of any public sector undertaking, the private enterprises may form a cartel and may, re and may give rise to oligopolistic tendencies in the market. Sometimes there is also a fear that a public sector undertaking may undergo strategic sale or privatization and can be sold at a lower value to a private entity which will again go against the larger public interest. And if the strategic partner is a foreign entity then it will become very hard to avoid external interferences in the internal economic structure and will cause loss to permanent nature of employment due to ease of hiring and firing. So now that we have discussed the advantages as well as the drawbacks of the disinvestment, we will see the types and the methods of disinvestment. Now disinvestment of a minority stake can be done in multiple ways. It can be done through initial public offering that is the shares of public sector undertakings which is unlisted can be made open to public for the first time. For example, the recent LIC IPO. The second example to this kind of disinvestment is follow on public offering also known as the further public offering and it is nothing but offer of share of a listed public sector enterprises. Now since 2012, offer for sale has gained prominence as a method of disinvestment. Under the offer for sale, shares of PSU 
are auctioned on the platform provided by the stock exchange. Another method of disinvestment can be institutional placement program. And under this institutional placement program, selected financial institutions are allowed to participate and the government stake is offered to only such institutions which are large enough to fund this. For example, large mutual funds, insurance or pension funds like that of LIC. Another method of disinvestment is that of cross-holding and in this method, one listed public sector undertaking takes up the government stake in another listed public sector undertaking. And the last type of disinvestment procedure that can be followed is the exchange traded fund method. Through this route, the government can disinvest its stake in various public sector undertakings across the diverse sectors through a single offering. This mechanism will allow the government to monetize its shareholding in those public sector undertakings which forms the part of larger ETF basket. Now, we'll also understand the trends of this investment in India currently. Now, if we take a look, it is very clear that in the last three decades, that is since 1991, various government were able to meet the disinvestment targets only for six times. And most successful achievement of disinvestment target in the recent past were associated with that of cross-holding, that is selling the stakes of one public sector undertaking to other, which is not considered as a good way of disinvestment. And in the graph, it is also clear that the budget estimates and the actual disinvestment proceeds highlights a large difference. With this, we have discussed what basically disinvestment is, how it is different from privatization, different types of disinvestment methods, advantages and the disadvantages of the same, and the current trends in the disinvestment. Moving on to the last article of the day that has featured on page 6 of the Hindu, basically highlights the India and the Nordic countries connect. The article talks about India and the Nordic connect towards a green transition. Now, in May 2022, Second India Nordic Summit was held. The leaders of the Nordic nations and India at that summit agreed to intensify cooperation on digitalization, renewable energy, maritime industries, and also on circular economy. This was the second summit as the first India Nordic Summit was held in 2018. Now, a summit level engagement with Nordic countries is important as apart from India, it is only the United States of America that holds summit level engagement with the Nordic countries. During our understanding of this article, we will try to analyze the relationship between India and the Nordic countries. And apart from it, first we will try to understand what countries basically form the Nordic region or the Nordic countries. The Nordic region is a geographical and the cultural region in the Northern Europe and North Atlantic. It includes five countries which are Finland, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden and the Faroe Island which falls within the Kingdom of Denmark. These countries are also represented on the map. Now that we have seen which five countries are the part of Nordic nations, we will try to understand the relationship between India and that of Nordic countries. What are the areas of cooperation between the two countries and where are the areas that remain untapped today. Now the first area of cooperation between India and the Nordic countries is in the economic sphere. India and the Nordic countries offer immense opportunities for trade as well as investment diversification. As of today, out of the five Nordic countries, the four countries are, are among the top 20 trading partners for India. And the cumulative trade between the Indian and the Nordic countries today is close to $6 billion. In the last two decades, Indian investment in the northern countries has also increased as there are over 70 Indian companies which include major IT companies that have their base in Sweden. And India also gives an ideal investment opportunities for the Nordic countries owing to the large market size that it has to offer to the Nordic country. The second area of cooperation between India and Nordic nations is in the field of innovation. India's flagship initiatives such as Make in India, Startup India provides opportunities for the Nordic countries having the expertise in clean technologies 
maritime solution agriculture to invest and india and the nordic country share robust innovation cooperation as india is among the one of the countries to have global centers of innovation which is run by finland which is known as finnode having main focus on clean tech education and learning the next area of cooperation between india and the nordic country is in the field of climate change as nordic nations are the front runners in implementing policies to address climate change and the energy preservation nordic nations source 63% of their electricity requirements from the renewable energy resources and india is one of the largest emitter of the greenhouse gases but it has committed itself to increase the share of clean energy and thus can use the expertise of nordic nations in this regard further among the nordic countries norway government has recently established a new climate investment fund and 1500 crores out of which have been invested in india the next area of cooperation between india and the nordic countries is strategic in its nature now nordic countries have welcomed india's application to the member of nuclear supplier group and the recognition of india as a responsible nuclear power despite not being a member of the npt treaty further nordic countries have advocated for the candidature of india in the united nations security council giving a permanent seat to india as well as expansion of non permanent members cooperation with nordic countries is also important for india to have strategic ties and deepen partnership with the eu as a region and the maritime cooperation with the nordic countries will allow india to strengthen its own arctic policy which will help india harness the strategic vision towards natural resources sustainable development and clean technology transfer however despite of these areas of cooperation and strong economic partnership between india and the nordic countries the two regions still have a lot of untapped potential for cooperation there is a huge information gap that exists between the two regions decisions and the policy maker as well as the common people in india have scant knowledge about the nordic countries and the vice versa there have been issues in the finalization of the free trade negotiation or the free trade agreement between the two regions due to divergence on issues such as sanitary and phytosanitary norms liberalizations of the visa regime and on the regulation and standards of agriculture export. further sweden stand on the kashmir issue and demand for bilateral solution was seen by india as an interference in the internal affairs and was a cause of contention or a bone of contention between the two countries so in the end we can conclude that india's cooperation with nordic countries carries a tremendous scope for expansion of economic ties for nordic countries also it makes sense to step up their engagement with india as it is one of the fastest growing economy and provides an ample opportunity due to large size of its market nordic countries on the other hand are pioneers in innovation clean energy education and healthcare and this present opportunity for india to expand its own strength by collaborating with these countries thus this highlights that the two regions are mutually beneficial for each other and the close cooperation between the two will be the step in the right direction